My name is Ed Lindley. Today I will interview Elmer Blankenhagen, a veteran of World War II. This interview is a part of the Veterans Oral History Project. The interview is being conducted in the Riley County Office Building located at 115 North 4th Street in Manhattan, Kansas. The camera operator for the recording is Dana Doddridge. Today's date is 21st October 2003. Welcome, Elmer. Welcome, Ed. Elmer, as you know, we start this with uh, a little of your background. Where were you raised? Where did you grow up? I was raised in Iola, Kansas, and I was attending Iola Junior College when I was assigned up with the Kansas National Guard, which was being federalized into federal service. And the picture that I have in front of me is the unit that I joined. I signed up for a year and a day. And the reason I signed up, the war clouds were coming up, and I had some college, about nearly a year and a half of college, and I wanted to get my military service over it so I could finish college. And uh, of this outfit right here, Battery A, there are three survivors now living out of Battery A, 127th. Now, Elmer, how long did you stay in then, uh, the service? Well, I signed up for a year and a day, as you know, and then I was stationed at Camp Robinson, Arkansas. And we were sent on the 1941 Louisiana Famous Maneuvers, where Eisenhower was a colonel, chief of staff, third army, and Patton was a brigadier general. And we went through the Louisiana maneuvers, and the greatest thing we got out of there was tactics. We didn't have any equipment. We had wooden guns. Our anti-tank weapons were orange flags. And, uh, but we did learn tactics, which proved very successful down the road. We got back to uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and we, start, we got some of our first selectees right off the streets, and I was assigned a group of them, kind of like a drill sergeant, to train them <laughs> to join the rest of the regiment. And then Pearl Harbor came on December the 7th, and I would have to have been released on December the 16th. My year and a day would be up. But we were alerted, and President Roosevelt said, everybody in the military, it's, it is for the duration and six months. And uh, the next thing we knew, we were on our train, destination unknown. And we, next thing we knew, we were in Kansas City, and the next thing we knew, we were going across the plains of Kansas, southwest. And uh, when we got to El Paso, Texas, we went blackout. They issued live ammunition. We set up machine guns in the yards at El Paso. We still knew the direction we were going. And we, next thing we knew, we were passing L.A., just heading north. And so when we got past L.A., they called us together, the, the sergeants and the groups, and they said, we will debark at Watsonville, California. And they said the reason we are debarking is the bridges. We had these 155 howitzers and these big prime movers, and they said there were a number of bridges that would limit us. So we had to get off, and we convoyed into Fort Ord, California. We never got to live in our barracks or anything. We went into the field to protect the West Coast. And our division had the zone between Santa Cruz and Santa Barbara. And we were right in the Monterey Bay area. So I spent the most miserable Christmas, other than the Battle of the Bulge, in a foxhole in 1941 in Monterey Bay trying to eat Christmas dinner out of that fog and rain. And I'll always remember that. That was 1941, Christmas. Now, Elmer, was the, this was the 35th Infantry Division. The 35th Infantry Division, which was... Uh, general Ralph E. Truman was a commanding general, and uh, we had four regiments, four regimental combat teams, and, and Ed, if you remember back there, they were square divisions, 
four regimental combat teams, and uh, that's what we went to California with. And we were under the 7th Corps, and we had to protect that, that wide zone. How about the training at that time? Did you feel fully trained at that time? Or tell me about how training proceeded after you got out there. Well, training, uh, our training was continuous. And, and I, I tell you, a lot of the training had to do with, uh, with the officers and the enlisted men. Now, my gun section, we trained continuously. We trained on weekends. We trained in evenings. Uh, because there was a war going on, and we had to use techniques that had never been tried before, and so we trained. We we carried our live ammunition wherever we moved. We had our live fuses. We had all of our powder powder kegs, and so we just practiced, practiced, practiced. And that's the way we trained. Now, did you go overseas after your training with the 35th? No, no. Tell me about how that came I'm about. I'm going to bring you up to date. When we got to California, they triangulized the division. That means instead of four combat teams, they changed it to three combat teams. And the 138th combat team, which was a part of the 35th division, was sent to the Aleutian Islands the Japanese were taking over the Atu, you know. I remember that, yeah. yes. And then they, sh they shipped part of the division over to Camp San Luis Obispo, California. And we went over there and trained with the Marines. And the 2nd Battalion of the 127th Field Artillery Battalion became the 195th Field Artillery Battalion, eight inch, the first 8-inch howitzer battalion of World War II. Mm -hmm. And that's what we had just had a reunion here in Manhattan of the 195th. And of the original 1,200 people involved in this battalion, there's less than 45 living. So we just completed this reunion in Manhattan. What uh, proceeded after that, Elmer? Sir? What proceeded after that? How about uh, then, the unit in going Well, when I was going, we trained. We when they redesignated the second battalion at, to the 195th, they shipped out all of the old soldiers, and we wondered why. These old soldiers went to Salt Lake City, Utah, and the Santa Anita Racetrack to guard the Japanese American tournament camps. Us young bucks <laughs> who had college stuff, they kept us together, and we were kind of a cadre to train the 195th. Good. So, uh, and uh, I, tr I, I was with the 127th and 195th until the last of July, 1942. And I was at a theater at East Garrison Fort Ord one night, and I, I was paged to report to regimental headquarters. And I reported, and Colonel Candy said, you will be on that train in Salinas tomorrow at 10 to go to Fort Sill to officer school. And so I left the last of July, 1942, for officer school at Fort Sill. Tell us a little about the uh, OCS, Elmer. The OCS, I was in class 38, and uh, it was the class that you double time and marched, you double time between all classes. And when I was halfway through, they stopped double time in between classes because they were losing people physically, even though these guys were physically fit. And the hot heat of August and September, it got to them. And so, and, but it was tough, and tactical officers were every place. That, they were trying to weed you out, see. And uh, in your bunks, you, everything had to be perfect. And uh, you had little cards up there with buttons on them, and, if you weren't in your hutment, the button had to be up there where you were at. And I bunked with two black soldiers, uh, a, an attorney named Bogany. He was my bedmate there, and I had I was bunked with another. And that was at Fort Sill. Our hour of a charm 
we got up at 5 in the morning, and at 5.30 you had your hour of charm, physical fitness. And then you went to breakfast. Of course, everything was attention. Attention table, attention to the going to the, you know, everything like that. A lot like the military academy. And uh, that's the way it was. After graduation from OCS, Elmer, they assigned you to another unit, I presume. Yes. Uh, I was uh, selected to go to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to the, second, the 72nd Field Artillery Brigade. And I was a spokesman for the, uh, this group, and I reported into this general who had just been sacked. I shouldn't put that probably. He had just right. been returned from North Africa. And he was this brigade commander. And I'll always remember when we reported to him, he said, I've got one project for you. This battalion had flunked their Army ground force test. And he says, I want these units to pass their Army ground force as soon as possible. So I was assigned to the 2nd Battalion of the 177 Field Artillery, 2nd Battalion. And that was in the November 42, last of November 42. And immediately I was assigned as a battery exec to train Battery A of the 177. And it was just below the the headquarters and the old general used to come down all the time and watch my gun drills and all that stuff. Yeah. So one morning he walked into the battalion headquarters and told the colonel, he says, I want Blank and I get in for promotion. So that's where I got my first promotion from a second to first lieutenant. That was rather, the, rather yeah, rapid. Yeah, it was. It was really, but I worked these guys because mm -hmm. I'd been an old chief of guns in sergeant in artillery and I knew what, what you had to do. Sure. And they respected me. And then shortly thereafter, the battery commander was moved up onto the battalion staff. So they signed me as battery commander. Good for you. And then in January, they sent me to ranger school. And uh, they sent me to ranger school. And I was in ranger at Camp Force, Tennessee. Yeah. And it was a... It was a precursor of a lot of these ranger and, and jungle warfare centers. Sure. In other words, we were a we were a test test group, and just how much a human being could handle. And we spent a month down at Camp Forest. My section, there were thirty five started, and seventeen of us graduated. Mm -hmm. And the only way you got a second chance if you fell out flat on your face, and you got a, which means you're putting all out I everything. See. And when you completed that course, did you go back to the 177? Then I went back, and then I became the PT expert for the, for four battalions. Sure. And I trained them in in this, to, and I got them ready to go to the desert. All this PT, but I was still battery commander. Yeah. And I took them to the desert, California desert. We went through 144 days of desert maneuver. I see. All in the Mojave Desert, California. Then we were alerted for overseas movement. This is the 943rd. Yes. And we, we were sent back to Fort Bragg with the 82nd Airborne. And that was in 43, Ed. Yes. And in 43, we went back there. In the meantime, I was, I went out, I was sent down to the 12th Corps staff at Fort Jackson to test. I was on the testing team to test two divisions for overseas movement. I see. And you probably heard of the 106th Division that was annihilated in the Battle of the Bulge. Right. We tested that division and we turned them down. General Jones was the commanding general and he got mad up on that stage. And I was with a Colonel Lewis, who was the chief umpire for the artillery. And I remember him telling Colonel Jones, or General Jones, said, your division is not ready. He said, I can't approve it. Well, you know, later they went over there and they and the 99th were overrun yes. in the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. And then I was a, a I was still a first lieutenant. See, because you had to have two years to captain.
I see. Back there, if you yes. remember. Yes. And I was still first lieutenant, so the old man called me in one day and he said, we have orders to send cadres, battery commanders, to activate four brand new artillery battalions, 155s with the newest howitzers and the newest tractors. And he says, you'll get a promotion pretty fast. We'd like to have you stay with us. But you see, they brought in some captains, see? Yeah. And you know what happens. Sure, they get the job. So we said, we'll go. So we, we were sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, yeah. and into what was called a new unit officer's course, where the colonel, where the cadres of the four battalions, just the officers, trained together and became acquainted. Good. And uh, two weeks before we were to go to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to activate these units, they changed our orders to Camp Bowie, Texas. Oh, yes. And I'll just add a little sidelight. Is where you met I was at I was at Camp Bowie, Texas, one week when I met my wife, Roxy. Okay. And uh, also on February the 21st, 1944, we activated these battalions. And I activated Battery A, 666 Field Artillery Battalion. Yeah. We had her cadre. And at that time, if you remember, there was a, what's called an Army Specialized Training Program where they had these guys at these colleges. Right. They're real sharp guys. They did away with it. We got a lot of those guys, and they were sharp. So we assigned them on the manning boards. We went in immediately into training. And remember, we activated the 21st. In August, we got our orders to ship out in August, so it was in February and August. And we went through all the Army ground force tests, we went through all of our maneuver tests, and we were ready to go. So we were given the word. Now this is the 666. Three sixes, yeah. Yes. And by the way, a sister battalion, the 667, if you remember the Orange Bowl, Missouri Orange Bowl team that had the Orth twins, the great ends, was those brothers were in our sister battalion, I six see. six seven. Yeah. So, so in October we we got on. A train slipped into Bowie and we got on in October of 40, 44. And well, forty three, I think, Elmer. No, forty four. Forty four. Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, October forty four is after the D Day landings. That's what I'm telling you. Good. That's what You're I'm right. telling you. See, both of my units that I commanded. We're in D-Day. Yes. Uh, the 943rd and the 195th. I see. See, they were, if I'd have stayed with them, I'd have been there, see. Sure. So, but in October 44, we were alerted. Well, we were alerted in August. And in October, we moved to another part of the camp. We got POM, you know, Preparation for Overseas Movement, signed all that. A train slipped into Camp Bowie on 1st of October, and we boarded. And then we went to uh, up around to Camp Miles Standish, mm -hmm. in back east. Yeah. And we got on a ship, the New Amsterdam, at Boston. And it was a new high-speed luxury liner, and we went over by ourselves. And that, that's when they came out with a new radar on these ships. And I remember the captain took us up there and showed us why we weren't why we were not going in convoy because this new radar could pick out the subs see Elmer the 666 was this a separate battalion or were you part of it it was a separate corps it was a it was a core battalion battalion yeah. a core see where you support see we supported a numerous divisions sure see and with the 155 with the high speed cats See, we could we could move, sure. and we we could be we could move uh, with speed. Yeah. See, we worked with armored divisions, we worked with airborne divisions, we worked with old infantry divisions, and. Uh, Elmer, tell me anything that took place once you get overseas. Now, I know you mentioned the Battle of the Bulge. 
previously. What was your uh, uh, service with that? Well, during that time. Anyway, we were we were in England at Wolverhampton, England, and uh, when things started developing over in Europe, we were immediately alerted out, and we got on LSTs and took over to France. And then we were, the first position we occupied was at right around Malmody. See? Yes. That's where they annihilated our, our, our artillery observation. You know, they machine gunned them in that park. I remember that, Elmer. Yeah. And uh, that's where we went into combat. Mm -hmm. And we worked with, we worked with uh, 82nd Airborne, we worked with the 5th Division, we worked with the 83rd Division, we worked with the 17th Airborne Division, and uh, the 29th Division. See, they, Corps Artillery, where they needed you, and the Corps Commander had signed you, you see. Mm -hmm. And General J. Lawton Collins was our Corps Commander. I see. Yeah. And I always remember when we first occupied our position, the first group would come up to check us with General Collins. Good. He came right up. The outstanding leader, was he not? He was an outstanding leader and well respected, yeah. Elmer, you want to tell us anything else about the war or where were you when the war was over? Well, we went through three, three campaigns, three campaigns. And uh, when the war was over, we were in the Ruhr, you know, the Ruhr Pocket. We'd help clean out the Ruhr Pocket I see. in there. And so we were actually in what, what became the British sector in Germany. And we were assigned to military government duties. And I was assigned to uh, Land Lippe, Christ Lemgo. Land Lippe is like a state and Christ Lemgo, see. And so we did military government work in that area. In the British zone. Yeah, for, for till, and then we were shipped down to uh, Sharding, Austria, and we did uh, military government work down there. And then our division, our division, our our battery was completed. And other our do so then they started shipping the high point men out. See, yes. and that was a problem. And then I was assigned to the 9th Infantry Division, and I was assigned as battery commander of Battery A of the 26th Field Artillery. Yes. And uh, we had orders to prepare this unit for overseas movement. And uh, we trained again, just like we did, but we got all these guys in there, and we didn't have a chance to train them, you know, and they want, they kept pushing because they wanted to go to the Pacific, sure. and uh, when they started moving them out, uh, there wasn't much we could do. You know, you just a lot of we just marked time on a lot of that stuff. We, but we did. We had jobs to do. See, sure. security, military, government, and stuff like that. We did all those things. Elmer, Elmer, you didn't go to the Far East, of course. When did you come home? Started home in July. Started home in July of uh, 45, and I got back to Iola, Kansas, the night before Christmas 1945. Then the reason we didn't get home is because there's all kinds of strikes. If you remember the coal miner strikes, the ship, the ship strikes, and we were in cigarette camps. Yes. And my job, we escorted troops to Brussels and Paris. <laughs> These were high point guys. Yes. And the only way to keep them busy. Sure. And that was uh, that was in the summer and fall of then I was sent to uh, I was sent to Munich and I was in military government work in Munich. I had a zone of Munich military government work. And uh, that was an area that uh, it challenged you. You had a lot of challenges in Munich. So, but 
We had some tough. We had some tough spots in the Battle of Bulge. We had some tough spots. We were assigned to uh, attach to Combat Command A of the Second Armored Division. Mm -hmm. We went through Julik, and our target was Cologne, and then we headed towards Cologne, and then we did a left flank and went up to Crayfield Opum, and up there met the British, and we captured thousands of prisoners on that march. I mean, we just circled them, and, and we got some fierce gun battles in there, too. So mm -hmm. that's where I got my bronze star there, because I got, I, I put there lost my life, but, but my team accomplished their mission. So. Mm -hmm. We got it done. Did you come home with the ninth uh, infantry no, division? No, no, I came home as a. Uh, they sent, uh, you, you know, they sent a lot of units home, and I was sent home as a battery commander of the 141st Field Artillery Battalion on the Joseph mm -hmm. T. Hooker. I see. Which, which was the Liberty ship. We had 700 troops on there. And it was a slow boat, I guess, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And we had a we had a a sergeant from Atwood, Kansas, come down with appendicitis. And uh, we didn't have a surgeon. Of course, you didn't have doctors. You know, we had a medics and all that yeah. stuff. So we we sent out an SOS for hospital ship. And we were supposed to sail from La Harve. They find it in order to move us. They sent us down to Marseille, and we sailed through the Strait of Gibraltar. And we're, we were past mm -hmm. the Azores, and this is in December. And mm -hmm. the, you know, rough seas, the Atlantic is rough. Yeah. So we sent out an SOS for hospital ship, and we rendezvoused with a hospital ship. We had to turn around and go back towards the Azores. And what we were going to do is launch our little hooker, a little boat, and transfer this guy over to the hospital ship. Well, due to the high seas, we lost the little hooker in the high seas. So we ended up shooting a buoy from the hospital ship to ours, and they transferred a surgeon from the hospital ship over to us. And he was a surgeon from University of Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh, I always remember that. And he said, I won't perform any surgery because there's no such thing as simple surgery. And he says, I'll use all of the uh, conservative methods to try to pull this guy through, See? Mm -hmm. which he did. Good well, four days out, of, so we, we headed off, and four days out of, uh, we were supposed to land at Norfolk. We hit high seas in December, and our ship started taking water, and the pumps couldn't handle it. So, Fultz was the captain of the ship. He calls together, and he said, prepare your life, uh, life preserver stations, check your lights, check your life preservers, and all that. He says, we don't know what's going to happen because you know those big ballasts in there, they would roll in those lip and those ships would sit up like that and it wouldn't move. They'd just sit up and vibrate. Cause this. So we, he said, I'm going to send out an SOS. Well, he did. And about midnight, started looking around, 360 degrees, you saw lights all the way around. And the sea was still rough. It was rough. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, he said, we're going to ride it out. He says, if we had, he said, we'll abandon ship at the last resort. But he says, if we do, we're going to lose a lot of troops, not only drowning, but hypothermia. See? So the Lord, the Lord was with us, sure. and uh, the, the seas started calming down tonight. And at daylight, you could look all around. There were ships. There were cruisers, uh, all kinds of ships. And so... The sea was a little more calmer, and so we were closer to New York. Mm -hmm. So they assigned the USS Honolulu cruiser to escort us into New York. And that was in the, in December of 1945. So, um, and I had to clear the ship. See, I was S-4, yeah. so I had to sign my life away. So I had to clear the <laughs> ship. And I never was so glad to see see the people, but they, they TV people, the radio, the newspaper, everybody was there, see, because, it, you know, they, an SOS had been sure. sent out. So, Elmer, that's when they shipped you back to Camp Bowie then? No, I, I went home. Yes, Iola. We were supposed to, we, train commanders were supposed to take a step. We were supposed to go to Leavenworth. They wanted to get them out for Christmas. 
They couldn't do it because Leavenworth was backed up. So the next choice was Camp Crowder, Missouri. Yeah. Same situation. Third choice was Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. Same situation. So they had Space Force at Camp Fannin, Texas, at Tyler, Texas. Good. And that's where we went. Good. And of course, Roxy was in Texas, see? Yes. And so December the 20th, I rode to Dallas. To my aunt, I had my relatives there. And they said, uh, you got to go see Roxy before you go home. So they put me on the train, sent me to Brownwood. I spent two days with Roxy and her family. They put me on the train, spent two days going to Iola, and I got into Iola the night before Christmas, about 12 o'clock. That was real good. Yeah, that was 1945. Now, when did you marry Roxy? February 46. 46, okay. Mm -hmm. Elmer we were engaged, sure. but I wouldn't marry going overseas. No. I would not marry. Yes, I See, yeah. We dated that. We dated all that period of time, and we were engaged in September. That's when I was promoted captain, too, by the way, in yeah. September. Yes. And I wouldn't. Uh, so she waited, and uh, we got married here in Manhattan in uh, February '46. Elmer, before we leave the war, we'd like to know about your awards and decorations. Do you have something you can show us on that? Well, I have, of course, uh, the one I'm proud of, because I feel it was to deserve was the Brown Star. Yes. And that was, I'm very proud of that. And then I'm a, I'm a proud of all of these, these other, John. I'm proud of what my, grand, my oldest granddaughter prepared for me, and she gave it to me when Christmas. Um, and she had wrote the the Army, and, and uh, they sent her a list of everything I was eligible for, sent her some, and then they, they organized this thing and presented it to me. Elmer, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, uh, I, I see the Bronze Star on my extreme left there, of course. Well, there are things here on the Army, on the occupation, and, the, and American defense, and the Middle East, and then there's some awards by the various countries, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, awards, and Austria. So I was involved in, in a lot of those areas. Sure. In military government and also in active uh, combat. I see. So, and uh, then this was, this is where I was military governor in Land Lippe Christ Lemgo. Yes. In Germany. And uh, by the way, I was also military governor in Vlotho, which was the Hollywood of Germany. Yes. The Vesa River comes down through there, and I was there for a while. Okay. Yeah. But I'm more proud of, of what Marta did, my That's oldest a, granddaughter. A very good display. Yeah. Elmer, tell me what you did after the war. Uh, how did you get back into civil life? Well, <clears throat> I, I, in January of 46, I came back, enrolled at K-State, graduated. Well, I'd been, a, I would have graduated, you know, at 42 with, if my schedule had been. But I graduated in January 48. I, we, uh, we had tri-semesters at K-State. And we worked tri-semesters. And um, then I did some graduate work. And then I went to work for Swift and Company in Chicago. And I trained in Chicago. And I did that for period of time, and then I went to work for Kansas State in Agricultural Extension, and that was in 1950. Your professional life has been spent in My professional life is uh, with Kansas State University, U.S. Department of Agriculture, in Agricultural Extension work. Elmer, before we leave your education, did you avail yourself of the GI Bill? Yes, I some? got, yes. I, I used that. I would have gotten it anyway because one thing, I was a strong proponent of education and so was my mother. Yes. So I, ha I saved all my military money. Irregardless if I hadn't had GI, I still went to college and got sure. my degree. Good for you. So uh, that was one of my goals. I had three goals. The general wanted me to stay in the service. He said, you, you're unlimited where you can go if you, if you don't trip. But I, had, I wanted to marry Roxy. I wanted to get my college degree, and those are the two major reasons I didn't stay in the Army. 
I mean, an active. Elmer, I know in active service you had a lot of work with uh, military government, yes. civil affairs. Yeah. Uh, did you join the reserves, and could you have used this previous experience in the reserves? Yes, uh, Ed. Um, um, I was in the civil affairs, military government work for 20 years in the Army Reserves. Uh, I was assigned to the Pentagon for 10 years in civil affairs, military government, and I carried six-day pocket orders, which meant I could be called in six days, and I had to occupy my chair. And I would go back there and do my duty, and they always had a project for me in my area, and I would have to pre prepare this project and, and brief the generals and brief the brief the might be out of Dodge City, Ed, and they might, I might have a telephone call from the Pentagon wanting my input on some issue was in my area, see? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and then I commanded Kansas Mobilization Detachment here in Manhattan for 10 years, which was a civil affairs military government detachment. All officers assigned to it were civil affairs military government, held mo MOSs mobilization in those areas. Elmer, I know you're proud of your son, a good friend of mine. Can you tell me about your son and about your grandchildren? Well, my son uh, is a K-State graduate, ROTC. He served in Vietnam and uh, in Vietnam. He got his master's degree at University of Mississippi and then he went back into service, and uh, he stayed in the service. He was assigned, he was on the staff at Fort Leavenworth Command General Staff for uh, about five years at Leavenworth. And then he went back to TRADOC, Training and Doctrine Command Headquarters at Fort Monroe, where he was in the Educational Directorate of the Deputy Chief of Staff. They were over all these 19 uh, military schools, you know, and so he worked. He worked in that department, and then he did. A then he was. He and another colonel was responsible for the uh, computerized stuff in tank gunnery, uh, Bradley fighting vehicles. He worked on all of that, and he wrote. He wrote about th three or four major articles on that in the command general staff college thing and so forth, and so. And then my son got his doctorate at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He got it on the ellipse of the White House, and Hillary Clinton was the commencement speaker. For, for, yeah. for, uh, and that was in 1992, or, yeah, 92. And we were back there for the commencement. And he retired, he retired from the Army. He was on the promotion list to full colonel. He retired, and he went to work for Merck Pharmaceuticals in, outside of Philadelphia. And uh, then he had three children. And Well, my daughter-in-law is an Army nurse. She was lieutenant colonel, director of nursing of this major reserve hospital in Detroit. She was also director of nursing of this 410th evac hospital at Topeka, Kansas which was one of the first mobile units was activated in Europe to go over just recent, well, in the Yugoslavia thing, see. And uh, she trained, she used to bring the grandchildren. She did active duty work at Brooks at San Antonio. And so she would fly into Kansas City with the grandchildren. And my wife and I would go up there and meet the grandchildren and bring them to Manhattan. So. <laughs> We, we had a lot of fun with that. We really did. And uh, and she's still active in nursing. She's, you know, uh, Marta, my oldest granddaughter that did this for me, is in Atlanta. She's kind of a theater major kind of gal. Uh, the middle granddaughter is a is graduate, and she's in the field of uh, biology research stuff. And then my little John, just graduated in May in, uh, from Muhlenberg, and he had 
three years of football. He, when we were back there for the introduction of the seniors, he was the only one introduced starting all the games, 33 games. He was the only starter. So he's down here protecting me now. And he went to work, he's works, he's a, he has a business degree in economics, and he's working for a, a unit back there in Pennsylvania. And this is his first vacation, and he come to visit Grandma and Granddad. How about that? You can't beat that, can't Elmer. Can't beat that, so. Elmer, you're to be congratulated on a very brilliant military career. And I'm glad that your son followed you in the military. And I'm glad that uh, as a football player, you have a grandson who was an outstanding football mm -hmm. player. Right. We're about ready to wind this up. Is there anything else you'd like to say for the record about your career in the military or your professional career or your family? If I had to do over again, I'd probably do the same thing. I really would. Sure. That's all. Thank you again, Elmer.